put people first, as I understand, is that what one of our uh, advocates used to say when people say nothing for us without us. Huh? So whatever policy, whatever implementation framework, whatever you as policy makers program and decide to do, have sort of a consent of uh, people who need that. People who need those services. So that's one aspect of put people first, which is that they are part of your policy making, they are a part of your implementation. They can also be part of your monitoring and evaluation and feedback framework, and they can also contribute to decision making. But when you move to public health, it's a larger uh, universe there. And in that larger universe, you realize there are many patients who are not many people with symptoms who are not seeking care. And the challenge is to reach those people. And that those challenges are surmountable to a large extent. But having said that, you still keep on missing people. And it is uh, the deaths among these missing people are a large proportion of the total deaths which we see, not trying to undermine or understate that deaths do not occur among those people who are under care. Deaths do occur even among those people who are under care. But if you see a large portion of death is those who have not sought care, or those who have not been diagnosed at all. So the first paradigm of reducing death is reach out to everybody, diagnose everybody. And like you right, rightly say, find all people with HIV, AIDS, TB, or any other disease. So that's the first dictum when you are on the public health side. Second is what most TB programs have now started doing is that they have started now screening with excellence as a screening test, not as a diagnostic test. So they scan you through an X-ray. If there is a shadow, in an X-ray, which is suspicious of TB or any other lung disease, then investigate them further. So this paradigm can be changed for PLHIVs. You can do that at least once a year with screening with X-rays. That will help you to catch them earlier. They may not be symptomatic. Every person may not actually report asymptomatic. So you get them at an early stage, what we sometimes call as subclinical TB. It can be picked up by X-ray and then investigated further. So welcome friends to another episode of Put People First series in the lead up to 25th International AIDS Conference uh, or AIDS 2024 in Munich, Germany. Today we have amongst us Dr. Kuldeep Singh Sajdevaji. Dr. Sajdeva is a known name, uh, a signature for sincerity and integrity when it comes to health responses. He has played a pivotal role in shaping India's uh, national TB program, spend, I think, sir, please correct me, maybe about two decades uh, at the national TB elimination program, which is the Indian government's national TB program. He also served as deputy director general at the national AIDS control program of the government of India. Oh, uh, you know, people who do well, sir, they go get more responsibilities. So you shouldered the responsibility of Southeast Asia Regional Director at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union, and uh, currently he's serving as the President uh, and CMO of Mulbio Diagnostics, and uh, 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 you know, co calling upon the governments globally, I guess, uh, to to for so that we can we can find all TB and reach to the people who are currently unreached with the diagnostic services. The, uh, finding the diseases, sir, is uh, also so important uh, when we want to stop the misuse and overuse of medicine. So as the governments and the world leaders meet at the antimicrobial resistance UN high-level meeting, I think uh, diagnostic stewardship is so critical to, uh, you know, if we, are, if we are to address AMR. Uh, so with these uh, opening words, sir, we welcome you. Thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. Sir. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all uh, friends and colleagues across the globe. 
uh, very delighted to be part of uh, this meeting and uh, look forward to a good interaction with you, Bobby, and uh, the community in general. Yeah. yeah, thank you, sir. When we look back at TB and HIV programs, sir, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we say that uh, no one should die of TB or AIDS. We have the tools, but I think 630,000 people died of AIDS in 2022. Uh, 1.3 million died of TB in 2022, uh, and 167,000 died of the co infection. Sir, your opening remarks of how could we have done better? Yeah, I mean, that remains a sad part of uh, the programming for both TB, HIV, AIDS, and so many other diseases that people still continue to die. And uh, that is where, where the programs need to do much better reach out to people. I'll try to give you a parallel. Like I was a clinician early for almost 20 years of my earlier career in a tertiary care hospital and we used to see patients. Huh? So it's, it's a more one is to one interaction when you see patients who come to you. They of their own volition and based because of their own disease have decided to seek care. And those who seek care are also uh, more sort of uh, mentally uh, prepared to accept what you are trying to tell them and what their disease is, react to it, be more adherent to drugs, and so on and so forth. So the, a part of uh, response is assume that patient will be or the, uh, let's not use the word patient, the person with the disease will be more uh, understanding, will be cooperating with the physician and so on and so forth. Having said that, when you move to public health, so in one is to one interaction, you also feel the emotions and other things of the patient. But when you move to public health, it, it's a larger uh, universe there. And in that larger universe, you realize there are many patients who are not, many people with symptoms who are not seeking care. And the challenge is to reach those people. And that those challenges are surmountable to a large extent. But having said that, you still keep on missing people. And it is, uh, the deaths among these missing people are a large proportion of the total deaths which we see, not trying to undermine or understate that deaths do not occur among those people who are under care. Deaths do occur even among those people who are under care. But if you see a large portion of death is those who have not sought care, or those who have not been diagnosed at all. So the first paradigm of reducing death is reach out to everybody, diagnose everybody. Like you right, rightly say, find all people with HIV, AIDS, TB, or any other disease. So that's the first dictum when you are on the public health side. The second uh, part of those who die while they are under care, even patients who seek one is to one consultation with the physician sometimes will have that unfavorable outcome. That is where probably you need to be more vigilant of other disease profiles in those patients, how far the disease has progressed, at what stage of the disease they have reported. Do, do you need to stick to the conventional uh, protocolized treatment or do you need to individualize treatment for that particular person? So what is known as a differentiated care? So there are two things. On the one side, those who are missing care, find all of them, reach out to them. Those who are with you in the system, can you offer them better care? Which I will use the word differentiated care, quality of care, or care sometimes beyond uh, protocolized treatment. Can you handhold them in their journey towards cure? They they may not, they may be responding well, but they, their social circumstances may be such that they are not able to so be sort of adherent to treatment. So there, there's another paradigm where you need to support them with out-of-pocket expenses and so on and so forth. I'm not elaborating on so many things which can be done with them. 
but these are two different set of people of course the challenge is on all of us to one find all treat all second those who come under care give them an individualized personalized care look after them well try to meet their social circumstances to the extent possible give them moral support and the support that they need from us and then we will definitely if we are able to do that we will be able to sort of cut mortality to some extent so absolutely bringing it to zero may may be very difficult because of the disease profile itself or the host response itself in some of the patient some of the people yeah. Yes, sir. So, so thanks a lot, sir, for uh, you know helping us understand this, sir. Um, you know, looking at uh, uh, T P, how we find T P among people living with HIV. So, please help us understand. Should we? How can we do, do better in terms of finding T P among people living with HIV? Finding it early and accurately, and also, sir, uh, in context of extra pulmonary T P, because that is also a huge challenge for uh, people living with HIV. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. So uh, the point here to note is that over the last two decades or so, since 2000, the paradigm of how do you find people with TB is also changing. The earlier paradigm which I referred is when you sit in uh, four walls of your chamber, patients are, or people are sick and they come and see, which is called passive case finding. So people are coming because of their illness you run a battery of tests and then you diagnose them. That's passive case finding. Over a period of time, people realized, the community of public health practitioner realized, but that is how no, not you are not going to reach everybody. So they brought in a new paradigm called intensified case finding, which is people who are already under your care. Can you look in TB for those patients who don't have TB, but they are under your care for different reasons? And the prime example is PLHIV. So PLHIV are under your care for because of the HIV infection and you're treating them for HIV infection. So intensified case finding but particularly for TB in these patients is that you screen them for TB on every visit. Screen them for TB on every visit and then sort of uh, diagnose them. Now the screening paradigms are also changing over the uh, last two decades. The first paradigm was screen by asking them symptoms. So TB symptoms are two weeks of cough, fever, more than two weeks, chest pain, blood in uh, your sputum, etc., etc. So <coughs> first paradigm change in HIV was relax those symptoms, make it cough of any duration. So don't wait for two weeks, reduce it. That was the first paradigm in intensified case paradigm. The second paradigm was reach out to them, all PLHIVs. One which are under your care, not only in institutionalized setting, but who are under your care outside institutionalized settings for community settings and screen them at regular intervals. Draw any uh, sort of a periodicity for them. At what intervals you would like to screen them? Monthly when they come for drug refill or quarterly or six monthly, that depends upon your resources and uh, both human and financial and the, the uh, how can you afford to do that. Once you de de define the periodicity, again, then now the pa paradigms will be how do you screen? One is verbal screening, which HIV programs have been doing for years, which is the most easiest because it, it, is, it doesn't consume any resources. Second is what most TB programs have now started doing is that they have started now screening with X-rays as a screening test, not as a diagnostic test. So they scan you through an X-ray. If there is a shadow in an X-ray which is suspicious of TB or any other lung disease, then investigate them further. 
So this paradigm can be changed for PLHIVs. You can do that at least once a year with screening with X-rays. That will help you to catch them earlier. They may not be symptomatic. Every person may not actually report asymptomatic. So you get them at an early stage, what we sometimes call as subclinical TB. It can be picked up by X-ray and then investigated further. So that is a, another change or more if you would like to do for those patients. You can do. It is also, in other words, an active case form. So from passive case finding to intensified case finding, which is verbal screening, would be an active case finding in a group which is sort of under your care. Not You are not going to community to do active case finding, but these people are under your radar. They are diagnosed PLHIV. So you can actually shift the paradigm of screening them for TB from an passive to intensified to active. Very easy because it's a very small group of people. In any country, the PLHIV will be a small percentage of the total population. So you're not screening the total population. Doable uh, in terms of resources. So if you move to an active case finding, define the frequency of that. Maybe yearly, maybe yearly, or anytime they, they report symptoms. So that will also allow you to reach them early. Diagnose them early and your first question, reduce deaths or mortality among such patients. So that's another paradigm. The third paradigm, which now people are trying to do, but it's very resource intensive, is uh, there are two subsets. Of it. One is uh, define the risk profile. So do they have any other risk? Are they smokers? Do they have diabetes? Are they exposed to silica dust, any occupational lung disease, so on and so forth? You can define the risk profiling. And when you or, or do they live in a areas which are difficult to release, or do they belong to a population which feels marginalized and hence do not seek care? Do they live in crowded environments, hence more exposed to transmission? So once you do risk profiling, of the entire community. Uh, generally, in our country, when we did the risk profiling, it's about 10 to 15% of the population which falls into this risk profiling. Okay, so again, a smaller subset of the population which you need to do, to do an active case finding in such population based on, preferably on a X-ray, which can be carried to the community. So you also sort of save them off out of pocket expenses. You are also more closer, more easy to sort of convince, talk to them, handhold them to do that screening. The last one, which is very difficult to implement on ground, but maybe uh, a time will tell at some point of time, can we do it in some pockets, which India has done in some pockets, is screen the entire population over the years and drastically reduce the incidence of TV, which they have. Specifically, people are looking at closed geographical areas, like we had an island called Lakshadweep, or some hilly terrains like Badgam and Jammu and Kashmir, which are closed geographical areas, practically uh, cut off from other people, not much of migration. You can start showing models of elimination in those areas, but that's a holistic, very, very heavy resource intensive. Uh, where you may have to look at certain classified geographies. You may not be able to do it everywhere, but you can attempt in certain classified geographies. Island nations like Philippines, you showed one example. One island in Bantayan. So you can actually screen those small pockets and demonstrate it's doable. So these are various models to sort of reach the unreached population of drastically fine TB in all. In PLHIV, it will be much easier because that subset of population is much smaller. Yeah, yes, sir. We totally agree with you. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, sir, uh, people with HIV uh, uh, are on lifelong antiretroviral therapy. So, yeah. very right, sir. It is such a doable thing and such high value in terms of 
uh, public health as TB risk is very high. Can you, sir, please uh, uh, emphasize more on uh, what can we do to reduce the risk of TB among people living with it? So to reduce the, uh, I'll talk of this subset of population, uh, which is PLHIV and their risk of TB. The difference uh, treatment as a prevention was the first paradigm of TB care and control, which has now been expanded a lot because they, the practitioner soon realized, even if you get everybody on treatment, you are not going to end the TB epidemic because it's a communicable disease which actually is airborne. So the communication is through, the transmission is through air, unlike uh, HIV AIDS where you need a close contact or a blood transfer or, or something like an injecting drug use, etc. So there you can define more uh, community more clearly, which is, uh, and you can sort of uh, know the risk, do the risk profiling and make a very focused way to do that things. Unfortunately in TB, uh, I mean, the, one of the most generalizable thing is that if you are uh, alive and breathing, you are at risk of TB. Because you are inhaling air. So which is not the case for uh, TBs. They may be alive and breathing, but they are not at risk of uh, HIV, sorry, which is HIV. So having said that, Within the same paradigm, we can also sort of uh, educate, counsel both the people living with HIV as well as the system itself, how they can prevent occurrence of TB in PLHIV. One, wherever the PLHIV is visited, those areas need to be compliant with the airborne infection control guidelines. I'm not elaborate into, because that is a different subject on airborne infection control guidelines and it will stretch a bit. But if you are compliant with all institutions or places where PLHIVs go with the airborne infection control guidelines and the airflow patterns, we'll be able to reduce that to an extent. And that applies to hospital settings, outpatient departments, inpatient wards, community care centers, that's number one. Number two, if PLHIV is travel to crowded places, I mean, they will also move out of institution. They're part of the general community. They'll also move out of the institution, interact with people, inter go on public transport, etc. This precaution would come for people living with PLHIV that, that they can use some kind of a mask so that they don't directly inhale the air which have, because you can't, in a crowded place, you can't make out which person has TB, which doesn't have TB, nor it is advisable to do that because you will be stigmatizing them or all. So it's better that you, you, you are on the side of caution. So if people with HIV, living with HIV, err on the side of caution and accept, avoid uh, crowded places, if you cannot avoid crowded places, wear a mask. So that will help them to an extent to less. Third is that uh, keep adherent to treatment, keep monitoring your viral load, keep monitoring your uh, CD4 counts, and you know whether you are getting prone and you need to change treatment for uh, HIV or in be more adherent and so on and so forth, or are you failing first line HIV treatment? So that, again, that's both on system as well as on people living with HIV, that they need to have a careful watch on the progress or stability of their disease. If not progress of the disease, you should know that you have to keep yourself stable on those parameters. They should not deteriorate for the, on the downside. So th they should not get well, worse. So if you are stable enough, your chances of getting uh, TB then get, almost reach that of the general population, which probably 
is the best that you can do as a PLHI free yourself and the system can offer that support to you. And of course, uh, all of the respiratory hygiene measures, if you are coughing, put, a, put your hand or elbow or a handkerchief so that you are not spreading. Spread the same cough hygiene in the general community, etc. For policy makers to not avoid spitting in open public spaces, etc. Use cuff hygiene. All those measures can be a great help, though not totally eliminate the chances of, you know, but they can uh, be of great help in preventing the spread of TB. Yes, sir. Th thank you. Let's hope that uh, you know we are able to uh, reduce or bring uh, TB transmission or TB risk or you know TB acquisition among people living with HIV and general population to zero, like the, or as best as low as possible. Um, uh, and especially for people living with HIV, thanks a lot for reinforcing that message that if they are on treatment, if they are virally suppressed, their risk of TB and other opportunistic, opportunistic infections will be so low. And um, of course, with regular monitoring, probably things can be uh, way different in terms of long-term HIV care outcome. I think we need to do more as uh, programmatically also uh, focus more now on long-term HIV care outcomes um, uh, for people living with HIV. And TB surely should be one of the things to look at. Sir, uh, coming towards the end of, of this, I'm sorry to take you to take so much of your time uh, today. Uh, can you please, uh, as you know, put people first as the theme of the upcoming 82024 uh, conference? And uh, so what does put people first mean to you? Put people first, as I understand, is that what one of our uh, advocates used to say, when people say nothing for us without us. Huh? So whatever policy, whatever implementation framework, whatever you as policy makers program and decide to do, have sort of a consent of uh, people who need that. People who need those services. So that's one aspect of put people first, which is that they are part of your policy making, they are a part of your implementation. They can also be part of your monitoring and evaluation and feedback framework, and they can also contribute to decision making. So that's one paradigm of putting people first. The other paradigm of putting people first is each such people may have their own unique individual need, which people living with those diseases may not have. And they may sort of, in terms of pure equity, not equally, equality, in terms of equity, they may need disproportionate amount of attention or resources compared to a person next to them living without a disease. So see to it that you are able to give them their right due in that aspect also. Say they, if they are not able to assess care, then you sort of allow them transportation or meet out of pocket expend expenditures, meet catastrophic costs, put something in their pocket or put something on table which helps them to sort of uh, fight their status with dignity. So that's the another paradigm of uh, putting people first. So first is they have a say in this thing. They also have some say in uh, disproportionate resource utilization. You are also able to put something on table. That table. I uh, I am cognizant of the fact that policymaker may not be able to do it in totality, but you are able to meet some of these catastrophic. Cost. And I mean, the paradigm is that there should be zero catastrophic cost. You should be able to meet. Again, they are a very small subset of the population per se. It's not the entire population of the globe. You should be able to meet. And there are brilliant examples in many programs on how they have been able to meet those catastrophic costs. The other is also on stigma and discrimination. Treat them like 
normal people have a conversation which is more universally acceptable they are treated with dignity respect and as any other member of the population so that's the third paradigm of uh, putting people first also programs policy maker must ensure that resources are available drugs are available diagnostics are available preventive treatments are available they are educated on that they are and sort of counseled and there is an advocacy on that if they need hand holding so there is some level of uh, health care support which is available to them so that's another paradigm of putting people first first and the last is in the research and development the new treatments are coming and new vaccines are coming the new drugs are being discovered keep them in mind that they will be the ultimate beneficiaries and users of those new treatments they allay their fears keep them in the development process and hold them in that same so that's also uh, from a futuristic point of view that is also very important and the ultimate uh, is for specifically for plhi it is not so much for other curable diseases but watch for their uh, chronic diseases and the comorbidities try to meet them and treat them and make them be as living life as near normal as possible and feasible both from the science aspect of it also from the society aspect of it. so that's how i understand put people first yeah thank you thank you so much sir only one word amen i think all what you have just said should be should be happening should be true uh, it is so important that people uh, remain central to the health responses again very grateful sir to have this conversation with you thanks a lot and i hope it would have stimulated lot of ideas and um, of course a very rich conversation and um, uh, uh, probably will help uh, you know improve responses not only tb hiv but other health responses have a great conference in munich germany sir uh, later this this uh, this month and uh, i should have wished you before but let me wish you now a very happy doctors day today is national doctors day in india uh, the birthday and uh, probably we lost dr b c roy today also the same day for both but dr b c roy sahab's contribution to uh, medicine and health is really legendary and india observes its doctors day and uh, you definitely have uh, you know uh, you know value you know kept the values uh which dr roy upheld so close to your heart not only when you were serving as a clinician um you know at a tertiary care hospital in delhi uh, for more two decades but also the other two decades where you have been help, helping shape programs thanks a lot sir all the best thank you very much thank you bobby thank you and have a good day thank you